Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we convene the fourth of five sessions on the theme that China is not our enemy. Uh, over the last uh, several days, we've been looking at uh, China from the point of view of geostrategic relations between China and the Pacific nations, between China and the United States. Uh, yesterday, we looked at the very important issue of propaganda and how propaganda serves to cultivate in the public mind the necessity of going to war. Uh, the enemy that is fought on the battlefield uh, is created at home uh, through propaganda. And once the propaganda is effectively laid down uh, and the enemy formation uh, is in place, uh, then uh, nations have the public support that is required uh, to uh, go to war. Uh, as uh, someone who was born in China, uh, who was raised uh, in Taiwan, uh, who spoke Mandarin Chinese as a child, uh, someone whose uh, eldest son uh, is married to a Chinese American woman, I can uh, testify firsthand uh, the effects of propaganda in the public mind. And when we read in the newspapers or see on the news that uh, tensions are escalating uh, and uh, conflict uh, is looming ahead and there are predictions of war, that has an effect domestically. Uh, people are not only killed on the battlefield, uh, people are killed on the streets uh, of America uh, in increasing numbers and injured and mugged because of the escalating uh, anti-Chinese uh, propaganda. So today we're gonna delve into that. Uh, the, the, the war against China uh, in the United States uh, as a precedent uh, for the escalating uh, tensions uh, toward war uh, in Asia. We're very pleased and privileged to have Code Pink uh, as a co-sponsoring partner uh, for this uh, five-day program uh, on China not being our enemy. Uh, I am very pleased to welcome now uh, Jody Evans, uh, the co-founder of uh, Code Pink, who just came back from an extensive uh, trip to China uh, and has really been at the forefront uh, of the political struggle, both uh, on the streets, but also back in Washington uh, to alleviate the forces uh, that would take us to war. Uh, so Jody, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's been quite a week already. It feels we've we've learned so much. And I want to thank you all again for joining and being concerned for the need for peace and understanding that China is not our enemy. This week, our guests have helped us to move out of that stranglehold of hate and join with them in witnessing the beauty of China, its people, its culture, its history. And I just noted that Shannon just wrote, in a peaceful world, there are no enemies. And I think, you know, it starts there. Why in the world would we make someone an enemy? Especially like as we're learning this week, people we don't even know. How 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 can we be forced to do that? As I say, the the war machine um, weaponizes our hearts and minds, and we're here to make sure that doesn't happen to you. I'm very excited for today. We have two special guests. This is the day we hear from Chinese Americans about the effects of the war and how it's affecting not just Chinese Americans, but Asian Americans. Um, because in the United States, people aren't very good at telling the difference. And so we know there's many voices out there and many views, but I think we have a, a pretty, we're, we've tried to be very diverse. And this is, you know, a judge from San Francisco and someone who served in senior management and financial services, telecommunications, technology, and media. 
one from California, one from New York. So that's the diversity we could fit into a, a short uh, gathering. But um, I really want to you know, get going because they have a lot to say and a lot of experience. Um, but they both know that China is not our enemy. And that construct has real costs. So first, my dear friend and someone I admire and adore, the Honorable Julie M. Tang. She's a retired from the San Francisco Superior Court after 23 years, making her one of the longest serving judges. She's received numerous awards, including Outstanding Chinese American by the Women's Auxiliary of the Chinese Benevolent Association. And she was inducted into the LEOP Hall of Fame of the Hastings Law School. She's the co-founder of Pivot to Peace, a partner of Code Pink in raising up that China is not our enemy for these past almost four years. Julie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jody. It's always such a pleasure to see you on screen. Um, and you are so right about the diversity of Chinese Americans. Here you have a New Yorker and San Franciscan, and we're also diverse, but very different. But one thing that's very common among us, and that is we're all facing a, an existential crisis, and that is anti-Asian hate. Now, as a Chinese American woman living in the United States since 1967, I no longer feel safe anywhere. Since the pandemic, assault against Chinese in the United States has been happening almost daily. I recall in the um, in um, in 2023, as we welcome in the new year, two massacres in California took 18 lives, mainly Asians, and um, and it's reminiscent of the February 2021 when eight people were killed, among them six Asian women, in three separate incidents by the same white man who targeted Asian women. His reason: he had sexual problems with Asian women. This is an outrage, truly an outrage. It's not just about racism, misogyny, it's about hate, it's about violence. And it's all happening at the same time, converging at a very critical time when we're all dealing with the pandemic, trying to you know, feel what I, uh, uh, social isolation is all about and, and trying to deal with that. And still we have another layer of very real, very real violence happening. Just two weeks ago, anti-Asian hate spread to Germany, where an American tourist sexually assaulted two Chinese women who had just graduated from American universities. One of them died. The next week, a pregnant Korean woman was shot four times, killing her and her unborn child in Seattle. I could tell you more, but it's really painful to do that. So what I would do is that I will share some figures with you so that you can understand the enormity of this phenomenon, how horrible it is and how overwhelming it is for Asian Americans um, to deal with. The FBI statistics, and I wanna use the FBI statistics because it really is a, quite a representative number when I look at all the other uh, NGO um, figures. They show that between 2020 to 2021, hate crimes from all races and not just against Asians in the United States rose from 8,000 to 12,411. Blacks are still the largest group of victims of hate crimes, but it is the Asians who took the number one, number one status as a group that experienced the fastest growth of hate crimes. Now, the effects of anti-Asian crime is, is basically terrible because up in, it, it, we're talking about upwards of 2 million people who are actually affected. Even though these numbers are you know, enormous, we're talking about even bigger numbers. And these numbers are actually just not as um, not the real numbers because they were collected from a whole bunch of <clears throat> police departments. Um, FBI later on did make their own assessments and discover that there were three times as many victims as those that were reported, but they were you know, required to just report these uh, official numbers. And Asian hate crime having risen the fastest grew actually 107% in a year. And this is followed by the LGBT, LGBTQ community, which experienced hate crime growth of 70%. This is not a pretty picture for our country's leaders. 
who have never been able to grapple with domestic racism and gender problems. They just let them fester. But in the case of burgeoning anti-Asian hate crimes, the US has been adopting foreign and domestic policies that are directly responsible for driving these widespread hate crimes against Asians and Chinese in particular. Let me share some history and information with you about why I'm saying that. In 2012, shortly after China rescued the United States from its financial ruin and meltdown, China bought millions of US treasuries. Obama adopted a policy shortly after that called Pivot to Asia. And the plan was to blockade China with US naval power in the South China Sea. I guess this is how you, you know, thank your um, you know, the people who did you a favor. And in 2020, during the pandemic, President Trump tried to shift the blame to China for his incompetence in dealing with the pandemic. He purposely used derogatory terms such as China virus, Wuhan virus, which fanned hate towards China and brought on the biggest onslaught of anti-Asian hate crimes. But it is Biden who not only outdid the past two presidents by continuing with anti-China policies, he started a name calling, kind of a um, bullying tactic. He called President of China, Xi Jinping, a thug in 2020 and a dictator in 2023. His policy too is in line with his rhetoric. He imposed one of the most stringent economic sanctions against China and engaged in military encirclement of China. He upended a 60 year treaty with China, the Shanghai Communique. This treaty kept peace and promoted prosperity in China and Taiwan for 40 years. But with the passage of the Taiwan Relations Act of 2022, which authorizes billions of dollars in sales of weapons to Taiwan, stationing US troops in Taiwan and direct involvement with Taiwan's civil and military administration, it created the most dangerous situation for war with China. And domestically, we are now reverting back to the 1950s McCarthy era. Thousands of Chinese Americans have been harassed, investigated, surveilled as spy suspects for China. The FBI director, Christopher Wray, who started the uh, program called China Initiative, which I will talk about in a minute, he openly discussed his office and how it treats every Chinese as a spy suspect. He called it the whole of society effect. The whole Chinese American society is involved in, in this spying uh, thing for China. He opened up a new China related counterintelligence investigation every 12 hours on the average. And as of February, 2022, he had 2000 Chinese American cases under watch. In 2018, um, Christopher Wray under Trump initiated the China Initiative. This is one of the most notorious and the greatest failures of all the counterintelligence programs directed at the Chinese community. The purpose of this program, to catch Chinese spies from the scientific community. Because the idea was that China is stealing all our technology, all our scientific um, information. Therefore, let's go after the Chinese scientists who probably are the people who are spying for China. Hundreds of Chinese American scientists, academics, and researchers from across the United States were being spied upon, charged with crimes, and their lives upended. Did this program catch any spies? Not one single spy conviction resulted in this million dollar spy napping project. The few convictions that the FBI was able to obtain were processed crimes like tax evasion, failure to disclose prior research relationships with China in the grant funding applications. These issues can be easily resolved administratively and civilly without the necessity of a program that uh, um, and, and criminal charges. But under tremendous pressure from the community, particularly the Asian community and academic community, Biden shut down this program in 2022. I guess if you cannot catch any spies, what's the use of keeping the program around, right? But long lasting harm had been done to the scientists and their families. And although this program is now officially terminated, the persecution actually is continuing through collusion with the universities, 
and the NIH, National Institute of Health, which is the funding agency for research. And many professors are still facing dismissal and other penalties from their positions. And in the aftermath of this program that targeted Chinese scientists, at least 1,400 Chinese sci American scientists left the United States and go to China where they could conduct their research work without fear of being arrested. Some report even put that number to 4,000. Additionally, in 2021, the United States started losing published research scientists to other countries, while China gained more than 2,408 scientific authors. And these are important because these published authors provide new innovations on scientific and technological research. They can get patents and it's a prestige for the country that provide these kind of materials for the world to share. So China is now gaining 2,408 scientific authors. And let's compare that to 2017, before the US-China Cold War took ground. United States gained 4,292 scientists, China only 116. So the tide has turned for China's talent pool recruitment. Chinese American scientists no longer see the United States as a beacon of hope for scientific innovation and participation. They're now contributing to other countries and the majority of them go to China <clears throat> where they don't have to live in fear of being used as a tool of war. In the long run, this is a real loss to America. Having failed to find spies among Chinese scientists, the FBI is now going for easier targets. The next group of Chinese Americans targeted by the FBI were workers who support US-China relations, who speak out for them. They look for Chinese agents under the FARA Act, which is the Foreign Agents um, Registration Act. One of the most ambiguous piece of law that I have read, that if you're close to China, you're speaking up for China, and you're doing things perhaps with the, US, uh, with the Chinese consulate, you can be deemed an agent. And this is where we find ourselves now with the Chinese community. You know, many of us have close connections with China because this is the country where we were born, where we came from, we love our culture, we love our heritage. But that in itself could be a point of suspect of being spying, of uh, being a spy for China. There are, the law is written so ambiguous, so broad. It is hard to determine where freedom of speech begins and where the concept of agency intersects. So how do you define that as a crime? But people are arrested. Let me give you an example of a police officer um, of, who were arrested. Now I need to um, share um, my screen, but I'm not, I'm not sure how to do this now. Let me see. I can't find that. Oh, here's. Um... You'll see share screen at the bottom of your uh zoom screen okay share screen okay there we go yeah. okay i know then click on what you want to share okay do you have it now not yet <laughs> okay <laughs> all right then um never mind we'll we'll get to it later i just want to show you a picture a beautiful picture of this police officer who is chinese tibetan He's charged with failure to register as a foreign agent. He was arrested in 2020. He spent six months in solitary confinement, released in 2023. All charges were dropped for, for lack yeah, of- Julia, evidence. it just showed up. It just came on, so we can see it. Okay, great. I'm okay. sharing it here for you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. And- um, and, and all charges were dropped. He lost his job and his, and his life and his family were in ruins. The next picture I wanna show you is, um, let, me, let me really try to do it myself now. You cannot start screen share while the participant is sharing. Okay, okay, share screen. And this is the picture right here. I'll hold center to see. Okay, I'll share. Do you see this picture now? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what picture are you seeing? China is not our enemy. A, a sign with a, about a dozen people behind it. Okay. Yes. The 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 this man this this man here 
uh, the fifth from the right is his name is uh, Henry Liang. He had just recently been indicted as a part of a wave of racial profiling and repression that targeted Chinese and Chinese American scientists, engineers, professors, graduate students, and now a hotel worker. They charged him with um, uh, failure to register uh, because he was exactly doing things that I was just saying that Chinese Americans do, uh, speak out that China is not our enemy and speak out on behalf of US-China relations. And um, he is now facing criminal charges that could land him in prison. These criminal charges against Lang, and I can stop sharing now, okay, okay. All right, these charges against Lang and, and, and the police officer, are reminiscent of the shameful history of the McCarthy era Red Scare, which destroyed the lives of many innocent people. These prosecutions are irresponsibly inflaming racist hatred against Chinese people in the midst of the worsening US-China relations and the surging anti-Asian violence. But there's a glimmer of light as we fight back against these despicable policies against Chinese Americans. As you may know, Florida has just enacted an alien land law that would prohibit Chinese citizens from buying land or real estate. Florida is among more than a dozen states that are maybe the past or trying to pass these laws. And the reason that they give is national security. But the law itself is so unconstitutional because it selects a particular group of people and decided they're no longer protected under the constitutional rights to equal protection and fair housing. The Chinese who were affected filed a suit against the state of Florida. And two days ago, the DOJ, Department of Justice, realized that a problem existed and it filed a brief stating correctly what the law is and why Florida's alien land law should fail. The brief stated that these alien land laws are violative of the constitution and Florida could not prove national security is in jeopardy when Chinese citizens buy property in the United States. The brief clearly stated that the plaintiffs would prevail. This is good news. And I hope that this will put a stop to the shenanigans used by the states to openly discriminate against Chinese people, forbidding them to buy property. This is also a decisive win for the Chinese community who have fought back hard against the laws. Our community need this glimmer of lights to affirm our resolve for justice and peace. Winning a small battle is a good thing, but peace with China and with all the other countries with the world is a bigger picture for America. And as long as the United States sees China as a hostile competitor or enemy, which it does, Chinese Americans will never have it easy. Our only hope is for ourselves and our friends to support us, to join us to promote peace between US and China, that we educate each other and refuse to succumb to propaganda and lies and fight the, the demons from within by pushing back on illegal application of the law by those who are sworn to protect us and pray that ordinary Americans could come to their senses, elect good leaders and reject war soundly. So I will um, pause at this moment and take questions later and give it back to Judy. Jody, thank you so much. Oh my God, Julie, thank you so much. And you know, just thank you because I know that's hard to share. Um, it's painful. And I just want to say I'm so sorry. Um, you know, as I was listening, I was thinking about earlier this week, you know, Mika telling us that she'd never felt more safe in her life than in the streets of China. And you started off by telling us that you, how afraid you are in the streets of the US. So I just like want us to sit with how profoundly strange this is that um, the, viol the violence that is being articulated that China is, is the violence that we live inside of daily. And I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that you came to share this. I know it's hard. And um, yes, the shame on Biden for calling Xi names. First of all, that's as immature as taking us to war and thinking that weapons are the answer. But, you know, Chi, who, when he first became president, made a pledge to take everyone out of poverty and succeeded at that. When Biden made a commitment in his race 
to get the young people to join in that he would take care of the planet and has violated that commitment many times. And just as we hear about these young, these workers who are innocent and their, their lives being destroyed, you know, because they, you know, maybe represent the government of China, which is absurd. Um, <laughs> you know, people from China can tell you that the level of absurdity that is. Um, that, you know, we've got APAC, which is an actual arm of Israel that owns members of Congress. So, you know, this is just to put it in context how really this is madness. Um, and so with that, I want to bring our next guest. And I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm going to let you know that I am telling you very little about him um, because there is so much to say. But Fred Tang is the president of the America China Public Affairs Institute. He also serves as the senior US representative of the China United States Exchange Foundation. He's an executive council member of the Center for China and Globalization and a visiting professor of Sichuan University. He's a fellow of the Foreign Policy Association, a member of East West Institute's Board of Counselors, and a member of the National Committee on US-China Relations. Mr. Tang was elected as an independent board member of US Badminton, the national governing body for sport of badminton in the United States. He's very diverse. Um, he, you know, he was in charge of multicultural mar marketing, communications and public relations at AT&T's International Consumer Long Distance Division at Oppenheimer and Company, he launched the firm's service into Asia, and at Merrill Lynch, he coordinated new financial products and services. A diverse human being with lots of talents, and I tell you, that's the short list. Welcome, Fred. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. And uh, it's very honored to speak after Judge Tan. Uh, I'm a first-time participant and first-time speaker. I'm very, very happy to, to learn there's such a group out there in the United States. After hearing Judge Tang spoke, it still makes me angry and, and helpless, even though I'm going through this every day. Clearly, there are rational and clear-minded people in the United States. And clearly, they know about China. But at this point, they're all very silent at this moment. I've met many friends who are China experts, but these days they cannot start a conversation with me without first in the disclaimer way telling me how bad China is before we can even have a personal conversation, having a cup of coffee and just talk. So I think that I don't blame them, but they are living in fear. And this is the fear that's dividing our country and, and is making us worst. You know, Judge Tang talked about a couple of the cases. I want to talk about a case long time ago, not during this period of time. There was a scientist by the name of Chen Xuesen, and he was a scientist, very accomplished scientist, loved America, want to work here. But again, it's the FBI investigate him, putting these false charges on him. And, and then they don't know whether to, so they want to deport him. Uh, and, and by the time when he was allowed to leave the United States, he was not allowed to carry one piece of paper with him. And when he went back to China, guess what he did? <laughs> he helped China to build the first atom bomb. So we do a lot of things that's, that's hurting ourselves, that's self-destructive. And, 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 and we're speaking out right now, we're not speaking out for China, we're speaking out for the United States because we're going through a period of time that's destroying ourselves. I'm so glad to meet with this group because it is the peace advocates during the 70s who helped save our nation, who raised the consciousness of our nation. And actually I would say, save lives. China is not our enemy. And many of the times our political leader have to try to make it sound like China is a threat. So I want to talk about 
something that many people, it's because it's a different model. Governments are also business. Yes, they are. <laughs> if you think they're not, <laughs> think twice. And many of the governments are operating on a business model. Many Western countries for centuries, they have operated on a model of war profiteering. They do very, very well creating war, fighting war. Even civil war, they create millionaires, killing their own people within their own country. But China is not that model. And it's mistaken for United States to think that they adopt that model. China has a new model. It's peace profiteering, which is unheard of in this world. But if you look at China, when China has an internal chaos, they become in a very dire situation themselves. Any country is at war, China does not make money. China wants peace and they're spreading peace because that's helping themselves. So they do not want to have a war with the United States. They don't want to see anyone having war with the United States. So saying that China is want to be a threat, it's really miscalculating and it's going to lead us into uh, situations that we are not prepared for. The Chinese people I know, and I've been traveled to China for a long time, they love the United States. Jody, you've been there, you see. McDonald's, Starbucks, KFC, Pizza Hut, Disneyland, driving Buicks. Um, you know, in when McDonald's first opened, a grandma will bring a grandchild, even though they cannot afford it at that time, go to McDonald's just to experience America. Um, I, and these franchises are opening at a crazy rate. Just for a KFC, at one point I was talking to, it's the Yum's brand, I talked to a friend of mine. So he said, he was telling me they will open a new store in every 48 hours. Wow, every two days you open a new store. And then a couple of years later, I said, well, you slow down? He said, no, now we're opening every new store every 36 hours. And I think the same situation with Starbucks and so forth. So through these type of consumption, you can see China love United States. Why would they want to be a threat to us? Secondly, Chinese study students love to study in the United States. Um, each of them have bring in, uh, you know, the, the tuition that they pay really help many, many of our colleges. However, these days, if a student want to study science, technology, engineering, or math, many of the times, their visa will be refused by our consulate and embassy. And that's not really just their work, but they're giving that order to do so because I've spoken with, with them. Chinese people love to travel to United States. Before the COVID, they were the highest spending tourists coming to United States at the average of spending about $8,000 per person at the trip. And so, so there is no reason to do this. And there is, there is no threat. Now, does countries spy on each other? As an American citizen, I expect our, my country to have an agency to spy on other country collecting intelligence. But I also expect other countries to spy on us. And that is a, a work done by those agencies. But they should not be crying well, we're spying on other people, it's okay, but if they catch something, oh, look at they're spying on us. Grown up, you know, being a spy is a grown up game. It's not for babies. So do your job and, and, and that's it. Um, the, the Cold War on this side, this time, is really on the US side alone. I, I was in China. I do not feel China is feeling the kind of Cold War as we're feeling in the United States right now. Their media is not talking about the US-China differences or, I mean, even though we're creating, our media is creating new sensational items every day in our news. I don't see that in China because they're too busy. They're too busy building airports. They're too busy building highways and bridges and they, 
too busy helping other countries to have peace, such as between Saudi and Iran. And they're doing much more. They're sending a special envoy going back between you, Russia and Ukraine and going keep on going back and forth. And I do feel that, that we, you know, many of these things that we have imposed, such as the trade tariff, such as the sanctions, such as the closing of the consulate, if the United States can stop, drop the tariff that we impose upon Chinese product, China will drop it tomorrow. And the sanction, which is ridiculous. It's a, such an old way to deal with uh, dictators. Those that the dictators, they used to own houses and apartments in the United States and bank accounts are all in the our allied countries such as UK, France and Germany or Australia. But the sanctions today is really the name only. It have no effect. They censoring the, 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 the chief executive of Hong Kong. So, so he just not gonna use his visa card because he doesn't have a bank account in the United States. He doesn't, so he doesn't travel. And, and because of the sanctions right now, we have an APAC meeting now and, and whether he will be able to come to the United States or not is in question. Our Joint Chief of Staff, uh, 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 General Austin, uh, uh, he was trying to meet with the China counterpart, but they would not reply. They would not meet with him. So during the Singapore Shangri-La dialogue, he went over at the same table to have the shit can with him. Do you know why the China side would not reply? Well, his counterpart is sanctioned by the United States. All United States citizens are not supposed to be talking with him. So this is ridiculous by sanctioning all these people really have no effect on them, except we should not be talking to each other. And lastly, it's the consulate. I think if we let Houston consulate be open, China will let Chengdu consulate to be open the next day. So many of the things right now, it can be resolved on our side, and but we didn't. And when Trump talked about China virus, he really stopped a chance for two major countries to cooperate on the pandemic that could have stopped short, that could have the research could have done much, much better and maybe can even prevent future ones. You know, China, they're human beings just like us. They don't like to take criticism well. So when that kind of thing is going on, it, it goes on. And then with the reason anti-Asian hate, I, I do want to make a comment on that. The so-called anti-Asian hate is really anti-China and anti-Chinese hate. Mm. However, our politicians do not want to even mention, our congressmen, our senators, they don't want to mention the word China. They don't want to feel they take the responsibility that they're ready to come from them. Because unless we look at the root cause of the problem, which is anti-China and anti-Chinese, we're not solving this problem. Okay. Does Asian people get hurt? Yes, because of the similarity. Just like Sikh Indian were attacked after 9-11, he was killed in Texas because he was wearing a turban. But it was not anti-Sikh movement, it was an anti-Muslim movement. So, you know, Judge Tang also talked about Florida. Actually, there's eight other states trying to impose this banning of property ownership that CP communists are not supposed to own. But you know what? When these kind of news start spreading, it is not the technicality of the law. It is these haters in our country that they hear this news. And the next thing they hear is a face like me, face like Judge Tang, even a Korean or Japanese, they see you own a house and they say, next thing is they'll burn down your house. Not all of them, 
but burning down one house. That is the kind of things will happen when this kind of ridiculous law is being passed because when it's dissimulated down to the base level, they're not hearing the technicality of the law, they're hearing a message. Does the United States have enemy? Yes, in this world, but the enemy is not China. And one day another 9-11 will happen. And by just focusing on China, by focusing, saying they are the enemy, instead of cooperating, we again will miscalculate and misjudge and our country will get hurt again. So um, <laughs> what to say, but I, I'll stop here and take questions. Again, thank you very much for this chance to speak. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much. So um, I just am so grateful to both of you, you know, Julia and Fred, because I helping this audience feel that the casualties are here, the, the, the pain is here. And Fred, I just want to echo what you said about in China, they're not experiencing this hate or, you know, that they just, they actually love Americans. They're kind of confused by the hate. And um, there's, even with all this hate, even with the US building up for war on them, it's not their concern. Their concern is the development of their country, the care for each other. Um, I, I think that's you know such an important point. And also just so sad for you to say that, you know, the US, even when the war is on its own brother, is making a profit on war and that you know China, the win-win of China uh, is, you know, war is not profitable. It is created so that that is not a profit. Um, I also, you know, one of the things that forced Blinken to go meet um, in China was Janet Yellen. Um, you've got two people in the White House, you know, who speak like you, um, who are like, you, you can't do this. This is horrible. And that's Janet Yellen and, and Carrie, uh, Carrie for the planet and Yellen for the economy. Because, you know, if the US decouples from China, the US is over. <laughs> and Janet Yellen knows that. The, um, we, the United States doesn't create anything anymore. We have, we have information um, monopolies, but they don't make things. And as we know from COVID, you know, what's essential matters? And advertising and financial services, that doesn't matter. How to eat, how to live, um, how to be cared for, those things matter. And, um, you know, for the United States to lose 1.5 billion customers would be a real deal. And as Fred said, like, there's more Starbucks and Kentucky Fried Chickens and Buicks in China than there are in the United States. And that's another thing we're not told, that it's a market at that the profit comes to the United States. And, and it's just shameful that we're not letting students come and study. And that's, it's, as Fred said, it's cutting, it's already doing damage also to uh, the, first of all, the culture of the United States and the economy of the United States that um, nobody talks about. So thank you. And so I wanna bring Jim back because, um, I know a lot of this is fresh information for him. So I'd love, Jim, if you have any questions for our amazing guests. Well, thank you, uh, Jody and, and Fred and Julie. You uh, really had a powerful presentation. So I just want to thank you and acknowledge the honesty and the courage with which you've spoken to our global uh, community. And Julie, I'd, I'd like to uh, start with you and just to recite something that happened just a couple of weeks ago when I was having dinner in Oakland uh, with my in-laws. Uh, uh, my eldest son uh, married a Chinese American woman and they were telling uh, me that they really just don't go out anymore. And they used to walk all through the neighborhood and that even in the Chinatown, it wasn't safe uh, because there'd been so many um, uh, beatings and muggings and and so forth, including with older people. 
uh, which was really a shock to them. So I would love to just hear you speak a little bit more on the, I would say the psycho-emotional effect of what's been going on on the uh, Chinese communities. Although as what you say, Fred, uh, uh, to many Westerners, you know, a Korean or a Japanese and a Chinese look basically the same, just like a Sikh, you know, dark skin looks sort of like uh, uh, an Arab and the uh, people who commit these kinds of hate crimes aren't particularly well-educated and tend to just blur uh, the ethnicities. Uh, but it's, it's having a real effect on the community. So uh, Julie first and then Fred, I would love to hear you just speak about uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, domain of the how the communities are internalizing the rising violence. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate what you just said because what you talk about uh, in terms of your in-laws experience and how they're managing their lives now is pretty much the norm rather mm. than the exception. I know it sounds strange um, to um, non-Asian, non-Chinese people, but it is something that we are living every single day and every single minute. I find the most safety is being in my home myself because as an older Asian woman, I, I am the target you know, of um, many of these assaults because we look vulnerable. And I know when I walk out and I, I just felt my own vulnerability. That's why I, I don't feel safe in America. I don't feel safe anywhere except in my own home. And I think that's how most people feel. And imagine uh, being a, a judge, you know, who heard cases for 23 years, feeling that way. You know, how do a, a young, how does a young a worker, you know, feel? So it is very real and it's, um, it's a terror that we all feel inside us. And it's something that uh, we are constantly thinking about. My sister came back from Hong Kong uh, after a short trip. She, the first thing she says that, I just wanted to stay there. It is so safe. And, and my, my whole body is lifted, you know, from this uh, fear of danger of being attacked. And not just the danger itself, but looking at the news every day, the anti-China bashing news, seeing how bad China is, what a threat it is, is an existential threat, and that China is going to, um, you know, China stole from us, China um, uh, will, will start a war, and, and everything, China is bad. And then when I look at the, the real news, the, the, I read Taiwan news, I read um, news from China, I read news from Hong Kong, I read also New York Times, Washington Post, mainstream uh, media, there's such a stark different approach, you know, to this whole U.S.-China relations. They are like Fred was saying, uh, Professor Tang, that they're more concerned about the livelihood of the people, how to sustain, you know, everyday living, how to provide safety, security for people, how to alleviate the, the remaining poverty that is that is still, you know, existing in China, and um, how to generate um, economic progress, build more uh, high-speed rails to take people from very remote places to the city. They are concerned about those things, but all we hear in America is China bashing. And that's why I was reading on the chat. Somebody is talking about reiterating all the propaganda, all these rumors that the, the leaders are telling you. And I'm telling you, they are fake. They are fake news. I learned a big lesson in 2019. I was born and raised in Hong Kong and I came to this country as a teenager. So I know Hong Kong and I read Hong Kong news and I keep up with Hong Kong from the ground level, not only from the news, my friends, from media. The way that the Hong Kong riot was pictured in America was like a different world, a whole different world. And, I, and the lies that they're perpetrating, it gives me no more respect or trust in, in any of the things that I read and in the, some of the things that spoken about by the uh, of government officials and from the mainstream media, I have no more respect for them. I now keep a very neutral perspective. I read everything. And in fact, every time I read something bad about China, I said, give me just one more second. And, and let me read the other side. Let me find out what they're saying. 
And then when I compare the facts, then I know where the truth arises. And this is what I did as a judge. And I can't believe I'm still doing that right now. But in the, in the 2019 riots, you know, um, they, these rioters were portrayed as heroes, okay? And whereas the January 6th rioters were portrayed as um, uh, a terrorist, uh, separatist. So when you look at the two standards that are being imposed, someone is lying somewhere. And, and Jim, um, going back to your a point about the, um, the safety issue, yeah, we are scared. We are so scared. And many of us are thinking about leaving this country. But how can we? This is our home. This is not just your land. It's my land too, okay? And I want to tell everybody, it's my land also. You know, I've lived here. I've, I, I contributed to it. I serve as a judge. I serve as assistant district attorney before I became a judge. I was on a community college board. I give my service to this country. And I am paying my, ta my taxes too. So this is my country too. And I'm not just about to pick up and leave. I'm going to stay here and continue to tell people what I know, what I see, and how wrong they are, the information that they are getting. And they should try to really appreciate and understand truth instead of just eating up all the lies that are being perpetrated. Wow. Uh, thank you. Uh, be Fred, before you come on, uh, Julia, I'd love to just ask you a follow-up question about your understanding of the uh, protests that have been taking place in Hong Kong. Uh, you're right that they've been portrayed in the American press as sort of the successor to Tiananmen Square uh, and that China was brutally repressing them to snuff out uh, any remaining democracy in China, uh, uh, including now Hong Kong. Uh, that's been essentially the storyline that has been put forward on, in the American and Western press. What's your understanding of what was actually going on in those protests? And Fred, you may have a, a, an opinion too, but that's a good um, uh, example of both propaganda and the 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 uh, dichotomy between the propaganda, what we're fed through the mass media, and the reality. You're a native of Hong Kong, so tell us what actually happened. For the longest you, time. You oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah. Oh, me, me. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a native of Hong Kong, too. I lived in Hong Kong from yeah. five years old to 15 years old before I came to the United States. Um, very short. I mean, I, I've been to Hong Kong and look at all the situations. Actually, a friend of mine, his name is Malcolm Clark. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, documentary uh, maker. Uh, and he made a, a docudrama about Actually, he reflected on both sides of the Hong Kong situation. And at some point, I would love to bring it uh, to the United States, have screenings, and you guys I, I will bring him in because it, it was uh, it's very, very well made, very, very heavy. But but uh, that's that's all. I'll leave it to Judge Tang. <laughs> Hong Kong is a very free city. For the longest time, um, uh, before and after 1997, which is the um, uh, 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 when China re when Hong Kong reincorporated back with this main with this motherland China, uh, Hong Kong has always enjoyed among the top you know um, cities in the Freedom Index um, that um, that um, uh, we have. And but the problem is it is also a spy city where all the all the Western countries, uh, in particular the United States and UK, have converged. They have been there um, working uh, in, in, in Hong Kong for the longest time to fan a lot of hatred and rebellion against uh, China, Hong Kong's motherland. And in preparation for 1997, the British government laid down a poison pill and, uh, and, and um, not only um, not allowed, not, England has never allowed uh, a freedom of election, um, so we're not talking about election uh, politics uh, has never allowed that. Uh, it is China that actually allowed that universal suffrage uh, in Hong Kong by allowing the election of the governor and uh, and other elected officials. But Hong Kong itself is a um, uh, 
what I would say, um, poisoned uh, city by the British government throughout all these years of colonization. The concept that um, Hong Kong people are superior to Chinese people in mainland is very much embedded in the mentality and the consciousness of many Hong Kongers. And with that kind of mentality and the Western worship um, uh, momentum going on, um, uh, they started a riot because there was a law that the government trying to in, um, introduce, and that is to allow extradition between Chi Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and China. At that time, there was a, a young man who killed a woman pregnant with his child in Taiwan, and he escaped back to Hong Kong. And Taiwan wanted the person back to, to Taiwan for to stand trial. And Hong Kong governor could not send him back because there was, there was no extradition law. And this is the poison pill that the British government left with Hong Kong that never enacted that law to allow extradition between those uh, three, uh, between China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And this was an excuse um, to riot. And the, the excuse was that, boy, if we allow this murder, uh, alleged murder to, um, be extradited to Taiwan. The next time, then everybody would be extradited to China. How ludicrous, because the extradition law is very carefully crafted and written to protect those kinds of happening. They have a court that would determine, and then that law was emulated up by, uh, um, emulates the United States and British law of extradition. Uh, there were protections, um, uh, uh, due process protections afforded to the person being extradited, several hearings before the person is allowed to be extradited. And, but with just with that, it sparked a huge riot that, um, and there were false information coming out. The first day riot, there was big news spread across Western media claiming that there was one to 2 million people that came out. Well, actually the numbers are not important, but the real numbers are about 300 to 400,000, okay? When you count all the routes of the railroads, like the, uh, the subway stations, the trains, the buses that converge into the city, they cannot carry 1, 1 million people. Reuters, the newspaper Reuters um, uh, publishing company actually did its own calculation and determined it's no more than three, 400,000. And I just wanted, and the numbers are not important actually at this point. What I was just trying, what I'm trying to say is that there's so much lie and that is so emblematic of the lies that came out of um, Hong Kong. What, what the, the police, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong police did was try to quell the riots. The riot caused millions and millions of dollars of damages. They were hoisting flags, um, promoting United States and promoting Western um, uh, uh, hegemony and claiming that China, Hong Kong would be better off if uh, the Britain come and retake Hong Kong as its colony and all these absurd things that were going on. And uh, Nuri Vidachi, a very a respected um, journalist and writer wrote a fabulous book and really clearly identified all the nuances that was going on the the way that the um, uh, the Western um, uh, powers tried to use this, this incident to contain China. It is that is really what it is: is to contain China, is to put is to is for separatist separatism, is to um, promote. Um, uh, insurgency, all the things that China has been, you know, talking about. Xinjiang is the same thing. You know, there is no genocide in Xinjiang. If you go to Xinjiang, if you see what's going on, if you just look at the realistic, 12 million people in Xinjiang, okay, uh, 12 million Uyghurs. If you talk about one to three million Uyghurs in, in, in prison, that means at least one out of every family would have somebody being in prison there'll be a big riot and there'll be immigration from Xinjiang. Nobody's rushing to leave China, Xinjiang. The Uyghurs are quite happy that they're staying there, they're working. And this is another big lie. So with all these lies about Xinjiang, about Hong Kong and Tibet, these are really insanely inhuman to be um, accusing China of something, of such a big lie, and then turn it around and say that these are our human rights issues that we have to protect. And a lot of people fought, uh, fall for that. Oh, mm -hmm. we, we don't want China because of the human rights issues. There is no human rights issue. The only human rights issue you know, is in America, is in the terrorism that we're experiencing, the, 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 the internal strives, the race wars, 
Blacks, you know, constantly being on the number one agenda as victim as victims of hate crimes for you know, and Chinese community fastest growing race uh, of uh, being victims of hate crimes and LGBTQ community. These are the things that we should talk about. These are the real human rights issues that we should be focusing on instead of spending money, uh, paying millions of dollars to promote this so-called independent journalism to you know, write stories about China, stories about Hong Kong, turning Hong Kong right into something like a, a pro-human rights issue. It is not. It is a riot, pure and simple. And it's a riot that's been paid for and gendered by foreign uh, influence and foreign powers to contain China. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking <laughs> truth. <laughs> Thank you for me. talk about these things that's been in my in my heart for so long, you know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, thank you so much. Fred, do you, you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add quickly three points. Uh, first, uh, I think that right now in the United States, people uh, have the uh, misperception uh, of China come back and China come in and take Hong Kong. They don't know the history. How did Hong Kong get into the British hand? as a colony, because the British were selling opiums to China and China had it. So they had a general want to stop the British from selling those opium. He seized the opium, he burned the opium. And then what did the British do? They sent the, the military. Of course, the military, British has a much stronger military. When China lost, the British make them sign a lease of lease of lending them to China, leasing them to China. Uh, leasing them to the Britain, of course, with, with no compensation. And, and it was Deng Xiaoping who took it back uh, from, the, from the Britain. So people have to understand this was Chinese land to start off with. It is not like China come in and take a piece of land. Uh, secondly, is that I, I see some comments about individuals. And I just want to say, we're commenting here, we're not to glorify China. We're not speaking about China. We're talking about United States. We're all American citizens. We are concerned for our country. The reason we're speaking up is that people do not understand the real situation that's going on in the world right now. That's why we're speaking. China is, is our ancestral land, but this is not my job to talk about China or glorify them. Lastly is I just think that as we're talking about hate, I think hate breeds war and war breeds hate. And one of the things that concerns me most about the war that we have, so many war, is that we have veterans that's left behind. Not every veterans come back with a happy home. Many of them, when they come back, they're homeless. Their family already left them. And they have mental issues. And we're not taking care of them. And that's why we're creating this kind of chaos on our streets but we're not taking care of that. As long as we continue to have war, we'll continue to have veterans who are not being taken care of. We'll continue to have people that are mentally dis disturbed and we'll continue to have the kind of violence on the street. And that's part of what's going on in the United States right now. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to ask a question because it's a question I have all the time. It's like, what, when we know that we've been lied to war for the last 70 years, and it has done that, when we can look at the streets and see the, the number of veterans that are homeless, when we, when we know the numbers, that it means it takes trillions of dollars away from the infrastructure and the actual care of our own communities what happens to our brains that we get sucked into these lies? Because they're so, first of all, like you said, we don't know the history. Like, I mean, and you know, Julie said, but it wasn't a democracy, it was a monarchy under England. And so when people say restore democracy, what are they talking about? They didn't have, you know, they vote now because they're with China, not, not when they were with England. And then, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of shocking that people believe these lies. 
because some some of the truth, you know, did get out around that. I mean, there were people in Hong Kong who said, America, go away. Just like the Taiwanese have backshandled to Biden saying, stop saying China is going to bomb us. You're hurting us. Hong Kong, people in Hong Kong were saying, stop, get your spies out of here. Get this dis these disruptors out of here. They're disrupting our lives. People in Hong Kong knew it was infiltration by other countries fueling these flames. And I also want to say that no one died. There are people protesting, not their government, but a, a cop city that is being put up in, in Georgia that is the precursor to fascism in the United States. People are protesting that, and they've been murdered by the cops. People in the United States have been murdered by our cops. No one in Hong Kong died. And like Julie said, we were up in arms around what happened at, to our, in our capital boat. Um, China is not allowed to respond to riots in the street that they responded, you know, to protect the people of Hong Kong. <laughs> so it's the, the what, what happens is for some reason, our brains don't understand the moment and what the healthy way to respond is. China it's like, has actually been very restrained, Jody. And if I may interrupt you, I, I'm so sorry, but Sometimes I kind of forget my train of thought and I kind of <laughs> speak up. Uh, during the riots, um, people, America actually in Britain expected the PLA, PLA Police Liberation Army to be coming in tanks and they're gonna, oh, they would love it to take pictures of this Chinese army coming into Hong Kong and, and they're gonna ruin the one country, uh, two systems. Um, and, and, and here you see how, how horrible China is, you know. China never did. The only times that the PL, uh, ASO, uh, pol the People's Liberation Army came out was to clean the garbage from the streets. They come and they clean up all the debris, all those um, uh, uh, nails, you know, they pick up the little nails and, and all the destruction that the rioters left behind and they went back into their compound. China never interfered because number one, they believed the Hong Kong police had enough sufficient manpower to resolve the situation. But they also respected the one, one country, two systems government, which they, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, agreed with Margaret Thatcher um, that he would uh, you know, allow Hong Kong to have. Hong Kong is supposed to have 60 years of this one country, two systems, and, um, and then it is renewable. And a lot of people expect that to be renewed, uh, renewed uh, before the riots, okay, before the riots before the uh, foreign interference, but it is not so clear now. And Hong Kong is more and more absorbed into China, which is a good thing because uh, China is now bringing, because, uh, bringing Hong Kong back into the economic uh, 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 geography. They, they, they caught, caught out a place called the Bay Area, which includes uh, Shenzhen and Dong, um, Qing, um, a whole bunch of little cities in that, um, uh, southern region of Guangzhou. And, and Hong Kong was supposed to be the lead city before the riots, but now uh, Shenzhen is the lead city. What, what they would do is that they would trade the technology, they would have an open market where people can come in and go in and out and young people can get jobs and they go back to Hong Kong you know, at night and because of the high-speed rail is so easy now, 20 minutes there in China. So they'll go back and forth. I mean, from here, from here, from, from San Francisco to Berkeley, you know, it is, it is how close Hong Kong to um, a, a, a China is and incorporate the, the, the two systems more and more firmly to promote Hong Kong economics and prosperity. So um, yeah, uh, during the riots, nobody died, like you said, Jody. The police were very, very strained, but they were the first group to be demonized. They were bullied, the children were bullied in schools and um, they suffered a lot. They still carry the scars. One police officer had one of his finger bitten, you know, bitten off is it is um, uh, by a rioter, and I think he only had a very short sentence. The sentence that they give out in Hong Kong uh, to these rioters is nothing compared to what we're giving out to the capital capital riots 
the January 6th riots, whose average sentence is six years to 18 years. In Hong Kong, they're six months to 18 months. And so um, Hong Kong has a very lenient system in, in many ways, which is good, you know, in some ways, because it's such a homogeneous city. And they have faith and hope that they can work it out among themselves through education, through more incorporation into China and enjoy the prosperity that China, China can and afford them. And like, like uh, Professor Tang saying, we're not here to glorify China or glorify any country or any person. We're here to tell you from what we see, what our perspectives are. If you don't want to believe us, then that's your choice, but it is time to listen to another side before you make a decision, before we go to war. All these things, all these things are doing one thing is like weapon of mass destruction, putting us to war. OK, uh, the, the people in the, the Capitol Hill, the, the, hawk, the hawkers, I call them, the, the, the very hawkish uh, uh, people have so such a loud voice. Now, they're snuffing out all the voices uh, in the Capitol Hill. You can only allow people to say China is bad. Anybody saying good thing about China get uh, banished. Representative Judy Chu from California Congresswoman, she was trying to talk about anti-Asian um, anti hate and she was talking about US-China relations. Well, she was declared disloyal by a Texas representative, Jim Hutton, who's saying that she's disloyal to America by mentioning China and talking good about China. And it's, those are the kind of things that they get you know, in Capitol Hill. That's why you even see the Asian representatives are not that loud or vociferous when it comes to US-China issues, except to agree and vote on issues um, that would uh, sanction China and sanction Hong Kong and things like that. And they're, they're not, you know, they're just not being themselves either because they are so under so much pressure. And this is uh, the kind of um, government that we have right now. I hope that we can elect better government, a better president in the next term, and um, really somebody who would, who would look at America and say, peace is our biggest concern. Peace with China, with the world is our biggest concern. So let's reset our agenda and work towards peace. And if we have to negotiate and, and, and enter in diplomacy, we will do that because that is the better way instead of selling weapons to Taiwan, uh, 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 building up our arsenal and reaching the, uh, weapon, uh, the uh, 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 MIC, the military industrial complex. Uh, those the things are not helpful to us. We have so much help domestically in, in America, so much need. Our fentanyl issue, and now they're trying to blame it on China. Come on, you know, this is a 13 year crisis that we have been having in the United States. We can handle it. So take care of it and not blame anybody else. Um, so, uh, Jody, I'm sorry you inspired me to talk like that. <laughs> no judge. <laughs> so I, I, I want to say more about what you're saying, Julie, about um, the buzz sawing of the members of Congress that mm. actually have some sanity. I mean, you talked about what happens in the streets, but I want everyone to understand that if you are a member of Congress and you are speaking like Fred and Julie, not for China, but for the US, and that to demonize China, to hate China is already hurting the US. When you try to say that, the word from a member of Congress is you are buzz sawed. Like you start to speak and it's just like buzz saws are flying at you and you have to duck and cover. And just what you want to do is like what Julie said. I just want to stay home. They just want to sit at their desk and be quiet. Now, if that is happening in our country, we have a problem. I want everybody to just feel what that is. We have silenced members of Congress. We have moved into their homes, people who are Americans because they are not safe. Every single person in this country, except for the indigenous community are immigrants to this country. Every one of us is an American. We've made, you know, more immigrants are more American than me who's born an American. They've studied more, they have more allegiance. They're, they've, they've, that's actually been something that's been crafted in them the culture of the United States and the commitment to them so that they could even feel safe to be here and that they're not safe 
and the members of Congress aren't safe. And I wanna say members of Congress like the squad, they can't talk about it. You know, that is the moment we live in. That tragedy is already happening. And I wanna talk about this, like the piece about how the story gets told here and distorted here. And it gets told and distorted to weaponize your heart. It is about lying to you. It is a violence to you. And you know what Fred said about how people are in China? It's like the terrorism of having to stay home is happening here in your own country by the people that have power in your country. This isn't about name calling and who she is or who the people in China are. This is about you. This is about the country you live in and how people are behaving here. That's what matters. And when, when the United States makes enemies of people, they die, the fabric of your society is torn, and that we have the blood of 20 million people on our hands since World War II. That our weapons, our military, our wars have killed like 20 million people. How many wars has the United States start, has started? How much terror has been embedded in the hearts of others? We experienced 9-11. If we think about how upset we were and what that terror felt like, why would we ever do that to anyone else? Why? Why? The news from China is distorted to use you. I mean, I was just in China and the woman that works at my husband's office said, I live on the same street where those people, um, she said 200 of them at most were rising against the, the COVID lockdown. What you didn't see in the United States was there were thousands of us surrounding them saying, go home, you spoiled brats that don't care about the lives of others. You missed that part, that those people that were rising up were pulled back, not by even cops, but by their community, calling them spoiled brats. So what does the United States raise up? The people that are the spoiled brats in a neighborhood. Instead of the Chinese who care for each other. And like Julie said, the PLA didn't do anything in Hong Kong. The police in China do not have guns. And you're calling it a dictator state. <laughs> dictatorship of kindness, maybe. Dictatorship of caring for the people. But that the, the, the country of China is a country that's created by the people, like all countries. And I just think we should look at the country we live in, the countries we live in that are white, that are naturally racist, unfortunately, that will believe lies before they will believe the people. I mean, I don't know, like, I feel ashamed when I listen to Julian Tang. I want to cry. You know, that Fred and Julie live in this country, contribute so much to this country, and still are subjected to lies and hate. And I wanted, you know, some of the young men that we work with that are not first generation Chinese, that are second and third generation Chinese, but are Chinese. What kind of, they're struggling a conflict of identity because they love being Chinese. They love their culture. They love America. What is that like when you're in a country that's lying and hating the confusion of a young person? It's up to us. And, you know, we have this campaign, China is not our enemy, and I encourage everyone to engage in it and share the, these truths that aren't in our mainstream media. But after being in Congress last week, you know what I heard is I heard that all they hear is war. They don't even know peace exists. They're in this, these halls. They have these blinders on. They're attacked all the time. 
they never hear about peace. Do you know that there's an embedded member of the military in every congressional office that goes to every meeting about foreign policy? Where is peace is what they said to me. So peace is China is not our enemy. That's what it looks like. It looks like being able to say China is not our enemy. And if you can do that, even just from the place of making them an enemy is going to destroy the comfort of your own life, start there. Start there. But we've launched at Code Pink a summer of peace. Remember the summer of love? That was about war. But we need a summer of peace. We need to make peace cool and loud again. Because if members of Congress are not feeling peace, we got to make that happen. They're the ones with their fingers on the levers of power. So at Code Pink, we have, we have a phone bank every day where hundreds of people come and we just call so that they can know that there are voices for peace. But I mean, like peace. Peace walks across the Golden Gate Bridge. Peace signs in your window. Paint your fence with a peace sign. Let's just remember peace. It's a value. It's important. It's important to life. Peace is about life. War is about death. I mean, we live in this time that is where too many people have lost the connection to life and it's up to us, but it's not, it's not. And I, I find this happens to people like, well, they have to fix. No, that's over. Let me just say they are not fixing it. They've, they're lost in darkness. They're, I, I've been there. I was in the halls of Congress. They are so lost and they're, they're lost. They're afraid. Like, what kind of member of Congress can you be if you're afraid? You can't make good choices from fear. We know that. That's why we're peace activists. You've got to make choices from a place of comfort, a place of security. That's where wisdom happens. That's where you make good choices. And it starts locally and it starts with you in your community. So I just encourage you to join us for this summer of peace. Do you know that summer ends on September 21st? And September 21st is the International Day of Peace. Well, a summer actually ends on September 22nd. But the last, the, the, um, the day before it ends is the International Day of Peace. And I want this summer to conclude on that day with us taking over New York City while everybody's meeting at the UN with the message of peace. So visualize that. Be part of it. It's like... We've heard these stories and I, I say this is an antidote to what is breaking my heart from hearing these stories and knowing, you know, that Julie's safer in her home than walking in the beautiful streets of her city. And, you know, and I, I wanna also say that Fred and Julie have different politics, but they come together around one thing. China's not our enemy. It's like, let's come together around something. Let's come together for peace. It matters in our community. It matters to life. It matters to the planet. The greatest contributor to climate change is war. So join us for um, our summer of peace because that's how you can take what you feel in your heart right now that was shared by Julie and Fred and give it form. Peace is Thank what you, we <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I, I really appreciate this. And, and I'm not here to ask people to um, feel sorry for me. I want people to know that I have so much courage because of what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing. I, I'd rather be, you know, somewhere else than speaking here. But I am drive by, uh, driven by the courage of Jody and Coping's uh, very active um, involvement in the peace movement. I, I, I think the people in my group Pivot to Peace also inspire me. Uh, we, we share uh, what we know. Uh, we also debate and discuss among ourselves. And um, we come from different parties. We're Republicans, Democrats. We are socialists. We are um, non-parties. You know, we, we just come from everywhere. We are so nonpartisan. But we want one thing. We don't want America to turn militaristic, on China and on anywhere else in the world. 
we want to get rid of the military industrial complex, bury them. And let's talk about, like uh, Jody said, what we can do to help the rest of the world and help ourselves. And I think America needs so much help, so much help. I mean, I was just reading some of the chat talk, uh, not just Asians, other people don't feel safe either because mm -hmm. we're in a, in especially people in San Francisco, New York, there's danger lurking everywhere. And that's part of the reason why I don't want to go out. It's not just anti-Asian hate. It's because we are a city filled with crimes. And where do these crimes come from? Neglect, the neglect from our government, the refusal to face up to uh, the, 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 a country is very important. A large group of people are impoverished. They, they are needy, not just veterans, but minorities and also white people. Most of the people who are now infested and drug addicted are young white males that I see in San Francisco. And there's all this loss of talents and resources. Uh, it's just not good for our country. We cannot just rely on printing money from a machine and, and taking merchandise from China and give them this paper money that we print from the machine and to be like this for the next 50 years. It's not gonna happen. And the de-dollarization is happening, it's not, because of China is uh, putting the blocks together using their own currency. If, if we are abusing our own way of uh, government, our way of uh, our economics, and benefiting as just a small group of people and leaving the large group of people um, behind. And we have to deal with all those issues. And I really hope that um, uh, there's another issue coming up and that's vices. Somebody also mentioned in the chat talk, and that is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That act, which is um, stemmed from the Patriot Act, which was enacted just 45 days after 9-11, the fastest enactment of any law alive, did away with um, uh, uh, warrant searches. The intel agencies, the NSA, CIA, FBI, can just determine who is a criminal, who should be surveilled, who's, uh, uh, who's a phone that we should uh, start listening in on, whose emails that we should read um, on their own standards. They have a standard, but there's so much abuse, even they themselves felt that, the Department of Justice felt that needs to be clamped down. The FISA court, also felt this is shocking, the kind of abuse that's been going on. Because as a, as a, as a foreign intelligence, and they're supposed to listen on foreigners, okay? Outside of our country and foreign agents in this country. But no, they're not listening to American citizens. Domestic um, surveillance is now rampant. And um, this act is supposed to uh, sunset at the end of this year. So let's work on sunsetting it or having some real reforms the court is overseeing it, but I don't feel it's enough. So it is again up to us. There's so much that we have to do here. Why are we focused on demonizing China? Why are we focusing on uh, fighting with China? Why are we focusing on saying China stole our property, China human rights, this and that? Let them develop their own society. China has its own system. They're not interested in transporting it to us. They have no interest to say that you have to be socialist. They've never said that. We are the ones who say that they have to have demo democratic system, our democratic system. Actually, they have a lot of demo demo democratic uh, governance in China too. They run by local communities and local and provincial communities. They all, all have a lot of say. And just like in America, the more I have more influence in my own city community in San Francisco, voting for mayors, you know, voting for uh, supervisors, how they run my life, how they regulate our cities, a lot more influence. I have no influence with, uh, you know, with what's going on in Washington. I know Jody's trying to influence the uh, capital, and I just, you know, I'm so behind her in doing that. I, I love her for doing all the things that she's doing. That's why I'm here. But there's so much that we can do together, and 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 let's focus on our domestic issues and really try to have a better government for ourselves and for the world. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Fred, do you have any last comments? Yes. Um, I think that the China hate and the China resentment really uh, stem from jealousy. And I have a suggestion. Why not the United States stop to have war for 50 years? Only 50 years. The next 50 years, stop having any war Stop advocating war, stop participating in war, stop doing war. Instead, we build better infrastructure, 
We're making sure all of our community have digital access. We try to alleviate poverty in our own country. And we work on the welfare and the prosperity of Americans. I bet you we will have miracles happening in the United States. And also our soldiers, which soldiers, parents, spouse, brothers or sisters, want to see them go to war. Yes, they should join the military. We have a military to protect ourselves in case we get attacked. But none of their family member ever want to see them go to war. That's why they cry when they go to war. So what I'm saying is give peace a chance for 50 years. This is what China did in the last 50 years. And look what they have done. So thank you. I also have one other, another suggestion. How about let's reinstate the people-to-people -people exchange, the friendships between people-to-people. -people. Forget about the governments. You know, do, do engage with China by visiting China and then bring Chinese people here to visit America. I think we need to reinstate that concept that we had that, uh, that brought on the uh, U.S.-China reunification. Uh, yeah, U.S.-China reunification. Uh, China normalization of U.S.-China relationship under the Shanghai communique uh, that, that there was a lot of people-to-people -people exchange. And, and go visit China. Just take one city. Uh, do a, go to Guangzhou, you know, go to Shanghai, go to Beijing, whatever city you want to go. Take one week off and see you for need yourself. The, you need the United States to open up flights again. Unfortunately, they're, 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 not. they're, they're not. making it so you can't go to China. So yeah. another yeah. problem of, of the United States. But Wow, what a great conversation. I love you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jim. Um, you know, yes, 50 years of commitment to peace. War is not the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. That'll bring us to a close, everyone. Jody, Fred, Julie, this has been spectacular. This has been truly spectacular. I so respect your integrity and your deep courage and passion um, for peaceful relations between the United States and China. Uh, so thank you all. And that'll uh, bring us to a close, everyone. You're welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link in the chat box, and then we'll see you tomorrow uh, for our fifth and final session on why China should not be our enemy. Thank you all. Bye for now. Thank you.